Okay. What? There we go. This is good. There we go. Okay, hello. Mic check. We are on. In a while. It's been like three weeks, I think. Okay. Hey, Snoozer Kyle. Yeah, we're going to do the FIFA stream again. Um, So, mic check, audio check, are we good? Hello, can you hear? Mic check, audio check, AV check. Are we good? All right, sounds good. Yeah, we'll do the sound stream. Hey, Mr. Bill, been a while. Hey, Mr. Bill. Okay, audio is good. Here we are, 4.30. Welcome. It's been about three weeks. It feels like forever. I mean, I had to put a peeper stream in there in the middle of somewhere last week because the students were playing capture the flags. Hey, how are you? I hope everything is well, Mr. Bill. Yeah, is everything going all right? Am I good at peeper? No. I'm not even... I try not to play the... Uh, I, I hate playing online. And I'm not even on the, uh, I, I don't play Rivals that much. I mean, I'll play Rivals when I need to do an accomplishment. Have to work or something. Yeah, it is what it is. Hey, well, hope everything is well. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you soon, Mr. Bill. You know, hope to see you soon. Um, so, so we weren't here three weeks ago. We had spring break. Then we had a capture the flag game for the class. Everyone had a lot of fun, and I thought about doing this stream before, like, the break, and I was like, nah, I think it'll throw everything off. I think it'll, I'll, I think it'll throw everything off. Um, back in the day, I think there was one semester, one time, that I did this session in two separate uh, sessions, but it was kind of a waste of a time. It was kind of a waste of a time. It was like, uh, there was a lot of filler information, but we can do everything today. Uh, we're going to talk about two topics today. We are going to look at some really, really bad code. We're going to look at some really, really bad code today. You know, programming. And then it'll lead to using static analysis tools. We're only going to do, so we're going to cover bad code and static analysis tool. Yes, I'll see you summer camp, man. Okay, so I don't care what programming language you know or you don't know. I think that's going to be, that's going to be like beside the whole point today. But there are just some things that you just don't want to do in any programming language. Um, and I'm going to show, we're going to do three examples to start off. I am going to show three really, really bad code examples, starting with the one that I have currently up. Now, each and every one of these three pieces of bad code that I'm going to that I'm going to show, they all compile, they all work, but each of them have one or multiple vulnerabilities, like. Things that you don't want to do when you're doing programming. So I know a lot of computer science kids like to say, like, okay, I, I like to program and all that stuff, so how is security going to help me? Well, here we are. So we're going to start off with a C exa programming example in C. 
Then we're going to look at a JavaScript example. And then last, we're going to look at a Java example. So here is the first example. The first example that I have up here on the screen, and I know I did this on Tuesday in class, but we're going to do it again just for those who are just well, are tuning in today. So here we are, we have a C program. This C program works. This C program, this C program works, compiles, but there is a big problem with it. Huge problem with it. What's the problem? Can anyone point out where's the vulnerability? Where's the horrible problem? Where is it? Yeah, where is the problem? Without even running yet. So SJS Smiley said buffer overflow. Which line numbers? There's a buffer overflow. So Randy Raydang said stir copy checks for no terminator without bounds of buffer. So I guess we're looking at poor line numbers. Yep, line number eight and nine. So line number eight and nine. Okay. Here we are. Perhaps there is a cardinal sin here. So we're again eight and nine as the same. All right. Lines number eight and nine. Perhaps there's a serious problem here, and why? So what I want to do first is, okay, I said we're not going to run this program. I want you to just eyeball this piece of code and just pinpoint where the vulnerability is. And right now, the consensus is line number eight and nine. The use of the C function, stir copy. So what I want to do now is, I, for those of you who are not familiar with the idea of a buffer overflow, a buffer is just a block of memory. A buffer, if you're not familiar, uh, is just a block of memory or RAM. Uh, some of you folks who have done uh, Introduction to Computer Science and C or C++ programming uh, may have heard of the idea of an array, of an array. Okay, an array is a buffer. It's just a block of memory. What about line number 16? Oh, line number 16 as well, too. Oh, yes, duh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Line number 8, 9, and uh, 16. Oh, yes, I didn't, I totally forgot, I didn't see that. <laughs> After all this time. <laughs> yes. All right. So now, let's actually run this example and just show what really happens. I got a terminal up. My, it has to be a Linux terminal. So I'm going to go to CD bad code. So right now I have one, two, three, four. So I'm going to remove bone, the executable, but I'm going to recompile bone.c just to show you there is no vulnerabilities. I mean, not, not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with compiling bone.c. Compile's just fine, no errors as well. More bone.c, here's the source code, again. Same, same thing I showed you. Here it is. Now, if I run bone.c, bone, the executable that I just compiled, and oh, we got a segmentation fault. That's not good. Okay. Argv is a second word that we, yeah. Argv is a second word that we type into the console after running the program. Right? Yep, that's correct. I'm going to clear the screen. and But this time, as thanks to CS Learning, I'm going to run the executable bone with, uh, let's say, a letter A. There we go. So far, so good. Stir copy, copying one byte into buffer two. Take a look at the code again. Here it is. So we're on line number 15 and 16 now. As you can see, copying X number of bytes into buffer two. Okay, let's do this again. 
So now I'm just going to have as a command line an argument, not A. Well, let's do two ways. All right, so far so good, so far so good. Not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. Copying two bytes into buffer underscore two. That's good. So far so good. No, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. All right, here we are, copying three bytes into buffer two. Oh, uh, buffer underscore two. Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Everything looks good so far. Not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. All right, let's do four A's. Okay, here we are, copying four bytes into buffer underscore two. Not bad, not bad, no vulnerabilities. Okay, buffer underscore two and buffer underscore one actually have a, they still look good. Uh, just take a look at, just remind yourself of the code. What's the length of buffer underscore one and buffer underscore two? Max length is eight. Keep that in mind. Okay, so we're gonna drive this thing off the cliff. Let's do, let's say, not five, let's do six A's. Okay, copying six bytes, six A's into buffer underscore two. Not too bad, not too bad, buffer underscore two looks good, buffer underscore one looks good, not too bad, no crash, nothing, nothing bad, nothing bad. What happened when we have seven A's? Here we are, seven A's. Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Copying seven bytes into buffer underscore two, not too bad, not, not too bad. Buffer underscore two contains yada, yada, yada. Okay, but it's seven A's and buffer underscore one still contains the word one, hasn't changed at all. But, okay, now let's get a little bit dangerous. Let's now have eight A's as, in the command line as the input. Ah, this gets weird. Copying eight bytes into buffer underscore two. Now, this time around, buffer underscore two have our eight A's, that's okay, but <clears throat> buffer underscore one looks weird. And the value is still five. The problem is buffer underscore one is now, well, doesn't contain the string one, it's blank. But let's actually get a little bit more dangerous and add like another A. So we have nine bytes, oh boy. Oh boy. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine A's and buffer underscore two, but buffer underscore, wait, is that correct? Yeah, buffer underscore one now contains an A. Well, let's actually do this again. Now I'm just gonna add a whole bunch of A's. Now we got 14, 15, now we got 16 A's. Buffer underscore two has 16 A's, but buffer underscore one also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight A's. Well, this is not good. And now what gets even worse is that the value is also screwed up and it's zero. Wait a minute. Now we have 19 bytes. We just keep on adding more A's and now buffer underscore two looks bad. Looks Well, looks good. But buffer underscore one and the value look really, really out of whack. Now we're getting to a point where the value is no longer five, but it is now a whole bunch of zero x six one six one six one six one. So if you may have, you may be actually fair. Why is it six one? Why is there a pattern of six one? Six one is the ASCII value for a lowercase a. And this is a classic example of a buffer overflow when you just go over way, or when you put way too much, you cram too much content into the allotted memory size, which was, well, you take a look at the source code, eight. And this is the problem. The real heart of the matter is lines number eight, nine, and 16. Really eight and nine are okay, but really 16 really is our biggest problem. Line number 16 is where the real serious problem happened, which is the use of the C function stir copy, which is to copy a string. And now I want to show you a little guide. Now, this is one of those cardinal sin mistakes that if you're a C programmer, you don't want to make. If you program in C and C++, there are just some, what is called, the dirtiest of the dirty C functions that you don't ever want to use. I want to give a shout out to my mentor and friend Gary McGraw who taught me this when I first learned of this thing called security back in uh, 2004. And I took a course with Gary McGraw called, um, he's a, basically the father of software security, and 
there are just a whole bunch of functions that you never, ever, ever see functions that you never, ever want to use. And here's a guide, okay? Common Vulnerabilities Guide for C programmers. This is what you call the dirtiest of the dirty. Most, vulnerabil yeah, most vulnerabilities in C are related to buffer overflow and string manipulation. So what is a buffer overflow? Well, CERN actually lists that buffer overflow as an anomaly where a program when writing data to a buffer, which we have been doing, overruns the buffer boundary or length size and overwrites adjacent memory location, as we just demonstrated in that whole Vuln program. In both cases, uh, this would result in segmentation fault, but specifically crafted malicious input values adopted in the architecture environment could yield arbitrary code execution. You will find below a list of the most common errors and uh, errors and suggested fix and solution. So here are some dirty function, dirty words or dirty function. Gets the standard I/O function gets function does not check for buffer length and always return and uh, always results in a vulnerability. Mitigation prefer using F gets and dynamically allocated memory. But why did it, okay, but why did it overflow from buffer two to buffer, buffer one? I know that it's consecutive, but isn't buffer uh, one somewhere before buffer underscore two? Um, that's a great question. Take a look. Buffer underscore one is at here, this memory location. Buffer underscore two is at uh, 2C, which I had to do my math out. Two C from hexadec. There it is. Forty-four. Okay. Is that correct? Okay. So it's like uh, the thirty-four to forty-four. Yeah, you're right. But but isn't buffer underscore one somewhere before buffer underscore two? It is. Yes, it is. So the answer is yes, it is. Buffer underscore one is somewhere before buffer underscore two. But does anyone also know? There is also another thing about how the stack works, a programming stack. Everything flows downwards. So yeah, you are absolutely correct that buffer underscore one is somewhere, quote unquote, before buffer underscore two. Great question. Going back to this guide, stir copy. This is what we've been using. The stir copy built-in function does not check buffer length and may very well overwrite memory zone contiguous to the intended destination. In fact, the whole family of function is similarly vulnerable. Stir copy, stir cat, and stir compare. That's a vulnerable code. Okay, so the mitigation is the best way to mitigate this issue is to use stir L copy if it's readily available, which is only the case in a BSD, Linux, a BSD system. However, it is very simple to define it yourself as shown below. Another uh, slightly less convenient way is to use stern copy, which prevents buffer overflows and does not guarantee no termination. But here's the problem. The bottom line is this. The C++, the C, and also ultimately C++, allows you to do quite a bit. You can do a lot with um, C and C++. You just have to know what you're doing. The, how someone described the C programming language to me was is that it is like a weapon that you can actually shoot yourself in the foot with, and too often people have done that. Um, there is no balance checking in C and C++. Absolutely no balance checking at all. So the reason is, and why um, stir function like stir copy, stir compare, stir cat, they're all dirty as of the dirty is there's no balance checking, okay? You can go over the allotted buffer size. 
and you can get away with it because it causes a lot of problems. So the big issue is buffer underscore one and buffer underscore two are size eight. You won't get yelled at badly. Um, in older versions of the C compiler, you go over eight characters, yeah, that's fine, but beware. Now, if you actually, now here's the funny thing. In a lot of modern compilers, I don't need this anymore. I'll show you what happens on modern compilers, especially like on Mac OS, uh, the C compiler that comes with um, this, um, that comes with uh, Xcode. I'll show you what happens. A lot of modern compilers um, actually have like what is called a stack guard built in, and so if you try to overwrite regions of memory that you shouldn't have access to, your whole program will crash automatically. So I'm going to do gcc minus old bone, bone dot c. But modern compilers would actually use a warning. Will give you like warnings and stuff. But now watch what happens when I run bone on modern compilers. That's a little more strict. All right, four, five, six, seven. Watch what happens. Port trap, cuts, program cuts. Hey Rick, how are ya? That's what happens on modern compilers. So you have at least that built in, but still buffer overflow is still a problem these days. Bottom line is to prevent buffer overflow, you just want to be, you really want to use C functions that have length check built into them, like a stir L copy or a stir, a, you know, a version of stir cat that actually have a length check or a bound check, okay? So these are some dirty and dirty at the, the function. Hey, Leppy, how are ya? Hey, Brick, how are ya? Okay, so some of the dirtiest of the dirty. There's a reason why I show, why I'm showing you this. Um, so let's do another example. Let's show you code example number two. So now you know with a C program, you don't ever want to use function like stir copy or stir compare without any bound checking. Don't ever want to do that. Okay, so let's see. Now, let's do a Java example. Let's do a JavaScript example. Set JavaScript, then Java. Here's example number two. Are you ready? That's it. Nice short program. Line number one, uh, 18 lines of code. Only 18 lines of code. And this is server-side JavaScript. This is server-side JavaScript, so you have to run this with Node.js. This won't work on your web browser. So what this program is, this is actually going to create a web server. At port 3000. Now, can anyone pinpoint the problem? This one is a glaring one. I'll give you a hint. Every, uh-oh, uh-oh, yeah. Every single programming language has this function. And Snoozer Kyle, where did you learn that from? Where have you used eval? Or have anyone ever told you that eval is evil? I don't care what anyone says. Eval is evil. Snoozer Kyle says eval, which you pinpointed exactly the problem, the vulnerability. Have you ever you? Oh boy. Every time I use it in Python, my senior dev friend curse at me. OS to, oh boy. Yeah, there's no OS that system. Oh boy. Oh, no, 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 no. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Snoozer Kyle and Eval. 
Every time I use it in Python, my senior dev friend curse at me. Do you know what eval is? Let me ex let me just show you. Let's see me. Let me pull up the JavaScript eval documentation. Let's do a search for that. Here it is. Let's go to the the the, the horse's mouth. Also, known as well. I love the primary source. I want to give a shout out to the good folks at Mozilla. Let's take a look at the JavaScript documentation for eval. What is, oh boy, oh dear. What does eval do? We're getting to that right now, Evan, that. What is eval? Are you ready? Every single programming language has an eval function. The eval function evaluates Java's code represented as a string. That is what eval does. The, again, hold on, I repeat. The eval function evaluates JavaScript code represented as a string. Take a look at the demo. Here's, here's the example. Console.log eval, well, 2 plus 2. So it evaluates JavaScript code as string. There is only one argument to eval, a string. And what eval does, it just, well, basically converts whatever the string is in the JavaScript's code and executes it. Eval. But here is a warning, is that executing JavaScript from a string is an enormous security risk. It is far too easy for a bad actor to run arbitrary code when you use eval. See, never use eval below. Here it is. Is there a function that keeps JavaScript going? Yeah, no, not really. I don't remember, I don't think so. Eval is a dangerous function which executes the code is passed with the privileges of the caller. If you run eval with a string that could be affected by a malicious party, you may end up running malicious code on the user's machine with, with the permission of your web page slash extension. Yada, yada, yada. Eval is also slower than the yada, yada, yada. Fortunately, there is a good eval, a very good alternative to eval using window. Okay. That's news to me. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's have some other fun. Remind me, okay, hold on, hold on. Python eval. Let's take a look at the documentation for eval in the Python programming language. Is there a good source I can eyeball? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, where's a Stack Overflow post here? I'm using the following class, yada, yada, yada. But however, eval seems, it seems to be considered a bad practice and often unsafe to do. If so, can anyone explain to me why? Show me a better way of dealing with the class above. Yes, eval. Okay, so here's the answer. Yes, using eval is bad practice, just to name a few reasons. There's almost a better way to do it. Almost always a better way to do it. Very dangerous and insecure. Makes debugging very difficult. And of course, it's very slow. Yeah, it's a Stack Overflow post. Uh, okay, we can get into an argument of flame war. Why? Okay, yeah, eval is evil. K dank by. Here it is. Let's go. I I, I guess W three uh, W three school have changed over the years, but what the Python eval function is, well, it's the same idea. It's the same thing. Function evaluates for a specific specified expression. If the expression is a legal Python statement, it will be executed. Again, eval is evil. It takes in one argument. A string which then gets executed by the programming line as, as code. There's one uh, required argument in eval, a string. Okay? But whoa, 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 whoa. Let's actually now do this out. Let me actually show you this example again. I have a web. This is a web server. <sighs> It only takes an, it's an HTTP post. Let me hide this, that doesn't get too damn distracting. All right. 
So it's an HTTP post. It's looking, it can need to take in some data of some sort. All right, let's do this out and show you why Eval is so bad. Node server.js. The server's on. There you go. Server's on. Here's my question. Can anyone actually quit the server? Can you actually turn the server off? I'm going to open up another tab. Another tab. Actually, I can do this. Server's on. Let's clear the screen here. So I have a web server running at localhost port 3000. So I'm going to do curl HTTP localhost 3000. It's not going to return anything because the expectation of a web server needs to take an HTTP post data. How you do HTTP post in curl is, H is curl minus minus data. And then you feed in like your key value pairs or whatever data you want to send to the server. So I'm going to send the word junk by way of HTTP post to the web server. And guess what happens? Woo! Got some data. The web server got some data. Junk. And end. Problem is I got no return cursor here. Uh, let me just feed in blah, blah. The web server that is running here got the term blah, blah. Anything that you send to the server is just, anything that, any data that you send to the, uh, to the server is a string. So I'm going to send two plus two. Ooh. Lots of data, two plus two. But wait a second. What if I actually sent a legitimate JavaScript function or object instead in, as, as a string? How do you do a, uh, how do you do a basically a quote unquote print statement in JavaScript? Console.log. So I'm gonna do a console.log hi. Watch what happens. Are you ready? What happens if I send a legitimate JavaScript function? Oh, oh, there we go. Control C. But what happens if I do console.log three plus two? You ready? Oh, got a five. What happened if I send alert? as just a functional word. I've never tried, I don't think i tried this before, but I'm gonna see what happens. Well, got some data in there. All right. But what happened if I send a legitimate JavaScript object? Now. That didn't work. What about request? Oh, sorry. What happened if I do console.log now? Console.log is a legitimate JavaScript function to be executed. Ooh, now we're getting real dicey here. What about the request object? Holy shit. That's a lot of data. What about the response object? Boom. That's a lot of data on the response object in Node.js. All right, is there a way that we can kill the server? Like quit it from running? Uh, let me just do one, one more. All right, the three plus two work. But what happened if we actually want to quit the server? How do you actually quit a something in, jo in JavaScript?
How to terminate a script in JavaScript. How to terminate the script in JavaScript. You have an exit function. Exit. So something exit. Okay, so it looks like there's an exit function somewhere in JavaScript that you can use to kill a server. Hold on, let's do this. Let's do this. Watch what happened. Here's a server that's still up and running. Curl minus minus data. Console.log. Process.exit. I think this will work. See what happens. Boom. Quit the server. That's how you kill a server. If you're using eval. Line number 12, it evaluated process.exit. So moral of the story, this one's simple. Don't ever use eval. Eval is evil. Okay. Do one more example. Java. This one I'm not even going to bother running because the, 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 this one I'm not even going to bother running at all because there's no point. Show me the vulnerabilities. If the program had is eval, so why wouldn't the program run the data? It did. Why would our command via data still run? Wait, we did send in data. The program had is at, what? Here we are. Oh boy. Oh, let's go. Well, hold on, Randy. Hold on, Randy. Hold on, Randy. Had is he. Oh, data is. Um, data ends up being uh, whatever you fed in. Oh, 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 oh. There are brackets added in. I forgot why I put those in there. I forget why. I forget. This is, there were brackets added in, yeah. I think the reason why I put those in there was just to make sure that whatever data that you feed in just got evaluated. I wrote this like 10 years ago. All right, that, let's go back to the, the Java function, uh, the Java program. Here's the program. What are the problems? Yeah, I mean, Ray, Randy, Ray Dang, this, yeah, that's just bad. Hard-coded credentials, really bad. I mean, that's a six-alarm, five-alarm fire. What other vulnerabilities? I mean, there's no even, there's, there's not, there's, don't even need to bother. Um, there's no need to bother even running this. I mean, it's just so bad. SQL inject, line number 13, yep. SQL injection, yep, by shrinking, that's a huge one. Couldn't do the, couldn't just do CQ, yeah, SJS Smiley, yep, that's obvious. Yep, absolute SQL injection, that's five alarm fire number two. If all you said, I mean, if all you said was hard-coded credentials and SQL injection, that's all you need. I mean, that's just really, really bad. But there's also a couple of other vulnerabilities here. There's a couple of other obvious, a uh, couple of other ones. One of them is pretty, gla it's also glaring too. I'll give you a hint, that's line number four. The username. I mean, yeah, this is SQL injection line number 13, hard-coded credential four and five, really bad. There's like also a couple glaring ones here too. Four is glaring as well. Default, yeah, that's it. Let me set the default login. Yeah, that's that's the third. That was the other one. Look, if your username is root, that's got God privileges. Now you know who the root user is. Now that you know the username is root, I mean, root can do anything. And you know the password, the root user password? Oh, boy. So the hardcoded credentials are uh, root and human horn 2016. You actually have not one, but two problems in line number four and five. One is over permission. I mean, your username should never be root. I mean, what is the principle of least privilege? You never want to use root as a username. 
Uh, yeah. You have a password. There's also another whereas a uh, hard coded DBUR. Yeah, that's another one. Yep, yep, that's 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 definitely but I wouldn't say that's a five alarm fire. That would probably be like a three alarm fire. It's not that bad. But there's something else. Now, I don't know if anyone ever wrote have ever written a computer program that have actually opened up a database before. But if you have never written a computer program that opened up a database connection before, but I'm sure that you have opened up a file. I mean, you've written programs that have written or read and write stuff to a file, right? Yeah, the input is not validated, not at all. You have the input validation is wrong, and there's no input validation. But there's something else here. Just maybe you gotta look very carefully. This program doesn't do one. I'll give you a hint. When you write a C program, Python program, whatever it is to open up a file for reading or writing, what do you all what what do you have to do? What else do you have to do? When you open up a file, at the end you need to what? You open up a file for reading or writing, and then at the end you have to close it. The problem is, and this is a problem if you're going to be writing web apps that actually opens up database connections. Um, there, and I ran into this so many times when I was younger. When you open a database connection, you need to close it. Let's say you're writing a web app where there's thousands of people actually using it, and the thing is, if you open up too many database connections, um, the program can crash because there is a limit. So you just leave it open. So, yeah, if you open up a database connection, and you should only be open one time or for one for every user, you need to close it. Because I remember one time I, uh, when I was running a database, a training database, and I opened up like a thousand database connection and the whole app just completely crashed the next morning. I was like, oh boy, what happened? Yeah, when you open up a database connection, you have to close the database connection. When you open up a file, you have to close the file. So how do you fix this problem? Line number 13, let's start off the SQL injection one. This is not good. You never want to do this anymore. Um, what is Java prepare statement? This is a documentation on how to use prepared statements instead of string concatenation. So, line number 13. Obvious SQL injection. Always want you solve the problem. Resolve number 13 by using prepared statements. Uh, what is that? There need to be a, here's the database connection, C-O-N-N. -N. So, it need to be a con dot close after the, um, um, exception handling, so it need to be a finally block, like finally, uh, I think it's con.close, something like that, that would do, uh, all right, but wait a minute, whoa, whoa, but what was a big issue, issue, I mean, the first one, you never want to create a username using root, but what about hard coding usernames and passwords, okay, you never want to hard code username and passwords, now, how do you get away from hard coding username and password um, in a program. Well, you never wanna write username and password in, inside the program. You always want to store credentials in memory. And this is what you want to use, what they call environment variables. Environment variables, Heroku. environment variables on any system any computer system you can store key value pairs you can store variables on a system okay so if you ever use Heroku which is a cloud system to launch apps to create and launch apps um, you there is a way that you can actually set username password and store it into memory by way of something called 
environment variables. Where is it? Yep, Heroku config. So this is where you set stuff like usernames, passwords, and all that. Um, Java. Uh, usernames and environment variables. Any password? Ah, here we go. Handling password and secret keys using environment variables. Take a look at what this article is. You know, I, okay, what should we do with all the secret stuff like password or keys that we have in our code? The simplest way to handle this, okay, the simplest and the wrong way to handle, okay, this sounds like a pretty good or decent article. The simplest and wrong way to handle these is important credentials are hard-coded in your code. When you push out the code to the repository, you are sharing your secret stuff with everyone else in your project. Even if you are using it alone, you can, okay, I'm going to post this. The safest way to handle your secrets, keys, passwords, is saving them in environment variables. Oh, there's a typo here. Damn it. In this post, we'll uh, learn how to save important credentials and environment variables and access them in a Python script. The Linux is to set, uh, seek, to set passwords or secret keys and environment variables on Linux and Mac. You need to modify it or yada, yada, yada. But, yeah, you would do something. Uh, okay. And of course, although there's a file that's within your system, it's not in the code. There's also another way to use a separate .env file for Python. Windows you can do. There it is. This is pi okay, here's a get over it. Your stack overflow pose is a secure to store passwords as environment variables rather than plain text and configuration files. Okay. I don't know what this is. Environmental environment variables are more more secure than plain text files because they are volatile and disposable, not saved. Okay, fine. Anytime you have to store a password, it's in secure period, but there's no, mm -hmm. So the best way is to use environment variables, okay? You never want to hard code username and password like these. I do have a fixed example, a real resolved example, so, by the way, hold on. How you do this in Java? Working with environment variables in Java. Here we go. Look at Twilio document. Environment variables are a great way to configure Java app without explicit. Ah, here it is. This is a Twilio document. Good. Environment variables are a great way to uh, configure Java application without having explicitly stored settings in code, such as for database, yada, yada, yada. Keeping such settings outside the code has several distinct advantages, you know. Help prevent it. Yeah, here it is. It help it prevents exposing sensitive credentials used, such as usernames and password and appointment tokens. Yada yada yada. So one of the most common ways is to use system.getENV, which accepts an optional string argument. And there you go. System.getENV and just looks at your system if like the variables is available there. And how to set environment variables is what you need. Yeah. Okay. When attacker uh, requested the same when you load it from the file, or the environment get burned itself afterwards. Now, actually, what happens is, yeah, the attacker would request it in the same way. Um, no, what happens is there's going to be an extra step is that the program will say, okay, what is, it's going to ask your system, hey, what is username? What is password? Uh, in this case, uh, here in Twilio, it says system got get env. The program will say, "Hey, what is the value of this environment variable that's stored in a system called shell?" So it just seems like to be an extra layer. Look, if you actually break in and steal code, I mean, if you steal, I mean, I mean if anyone breaks in and steal this piece of code, then well, unfortunately, username and password are right there. 
Well, if it's using environment variables, on the other hand, it's going to be a, definitely a, a little bit more work to do in that you have to look at the system and, okay, what is the, where's the username and password stored? So the environment variables, they kind of burn itself afterwards, such as like when you turn off a system. But environment variables are always loaded when the system is booted. I'll give you an example. Actually, hold on. That, uh, since you asked, so to see all the environment variables that are printed on that are available on your system, is print env. So these are all examples of environment variables: shell and the value. Everything that is before the equal sign is the key. Everything that's after the equal sign is a value. So the environment variable user, all caps, in this case, username is mchow. I have no username and passwords here. But I does have a lot of information such as like where important programs are stored. PWD is an environment variable, my home, my login name. Yeah. Every system, every major system have print env. Okay, if you want to set an environment variable on your system, ah, you have to do something like export. Oh. Yeah, but print env, print out the environment. Yeah, the print env environment uh, utility prints out the names and values of variables in your environment or your system with one name slash value pair per line. There you go. Now you learned something. But yeah, you never just hard coded credential really, really bad. So why did I do these three examples? Well, here's the thing. We have not one, not two, three examples of really bad code. Now these code examples that I show were pretty short today. But what happened if you have like hundreds of thousands, you're working with a code base or program that had hundreds of thousands of lines of code, which is pretty normal uh, or kind of low in, if you're talking about the real environment. So unfortunately, if you're gonna be writing code in like a professional setting or like a big project, there's always, you know, chances are you may not be able to catch everything with your own eyes. This is where you want to use like a code scanning tool or what is called static analysis tool. Okay, so static analysis. I'll just write a little note file here. Static analysis. What static analysis really is, is code scanning, okay? No execution of code. No execution. I was never going to run a binary, i.e. never run the binary. 100% code coverage. 100% code coverage. Okay? So it's gonna look at every single line of code. It's gonna pinpoint problem. Okay, um, the problem can be lots of false positives. Also, another one, hard to prove vulnerabilities, okay? But if you remember the first example that we did, okay, and the vuln.c, if you use a static analysis tool, it's just going to be, and then a static analysis tool is going to pick up the vulnerability usually pretty quickly. Stir copy. Okay, so a code scanning tool is just going to look at, whoa, 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 using stir copy, that's bad. What static analysis tools don't do a good job is why, showing you why is it bad, okay? It's just really bad to use stir copy. Or in the Java example, in the JavaScript example, it's really bad to use eval. I'm gonna copy this for you. I'm gonna make a copy of this, okay? But I want to explain, okay, now, what are the, what are example static analysis tools out there? Uh, example number one is um, grep. 
I mean, you can write your own static analysis tool using grep and then just a list of dirty words. Two is lint. Most programming languages have a tool called lint built in, have a tool called lint. Uh, anyone a Python buff here? Python lint. Linting Python and oh, oh shit. Take a look. Linting Python. Look at that. Linting highlights syntactical and stylistic problems in your Python code, which often help you identify and correct several programming errors or unconventional. Yay. I didn't know this is built into Visual Studio Code. Okay. If you by okay, if you require third party linters for additional problem detection, however, you can enable them using Python select linter. Oh, here we go. Oh that is so cool. Run the linter. Oh that is cool. It says here's an example. So if you're a Python person. Yeah, is it intentional? Yeah, I guess that's weird because the schedule says I'm teaching class today, but the stream is like, what? I have to fix the stream. I don't know how that works. I thought it would revert to the old back thing, Anker. Weird. General lint settings. There it is. Um, Python lint. Ah, here it is. Python lint is a source code bug and quality checker. Cons of linter. I want to take a copy of the JavaScript code here. JavaScript lint. There it is. JavaScript lint is JS lint. This is the famous JS lint. There it is. So I'm just gonna delete all this and I'm just gonna say JS lint. And of course there's no warning before. Well, oh, there's no code. What if I copy all of this in here? And paste it in. Remember that? See what happens. Ooh. So basically it and you can see the problem with static analysis tools like JS lint. Basically it just reported a warning or an error or warning with every single Basically, every single line becomes a warning. It's like, what? Use spaces, not tabs. Oh. Use spaces, not tabs. Undeclared console. What? Unexpected val, eval. Oh, there it is. Empty block. Oh. Well, that sucks. So you can see static analysis can be really annoying. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. So JS Lint, JavaScript code quality. What are the other ones? Anyone do Ruby on Rails here? Anyone do Ruby on Rails? Breaksman. If you're for doing Ruby on Rails development, Breaksman is a very famous static analysis tool. Breakman is a free vulnerability scanner specifically designed for Ruby on Rails application. It statically analyzes uh, Rails application code to find security issues at any stage of development. Is there a student version of Vera code? Oh no, oh, no, 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 hold on, we're, we're getting to that. We're gonna get to that in a few minutes. Breaksman is a security scanner for Ruby on Rails app. Unlike many web scanners, Breakman looks at the source code of your application. This means that you do not have to set up your whole application stack for the use of it. Oh, pretty nice. All right. Um, what if I also told you now that GitHub does can do code scanning for you? Yeah, GitHub. GitHub now has code scanning. Okay. There it is. Code scanning is a feature that allows you to analyze code in a GitHub repository or find security vulnerabilities and coding errors. Any problems identified by the staff, by the analyses are shown in GitHub. Okay. So if your code scans uh, find potential vulnerabilities in your code, GitHub displays an alert in your repository. After you fix that code that triggers the alert, GitHub closes the alert for more information managing. Okay. How about this? Setting up code scanning for your repository. 
You can do this for any app now. If you have permission, if you have right permission to a repository, you can set up or configure a code scanning for that repository. Here's the documentation. You can, there's so many, so many tools. Look at that. Mm. Yeah, you may be actually wondering, did I have any examples of apps that actually have code scanning? Yeah, I actually do. Where the hell is my repo? Oh, here it is. Your repositories. So I have this project on Medford Temperature Reporting. Been archived. A lot of people, this was written back in, like, literally, like, that March of the pandemic. Oh, shutters. A lot of relevant people take temperatures several times a day and text their temperature readings. This was actually, if you want to actually, a little background on it, it was Tony Monaco that actually asked me to build this. Yeah, Tufts University, Tony Monaco. So I've logged into my GitHub account, but now if I go to security, ooh, I have code scanning alerts. I haven't set one up, but I also have the Pendabox alerts. Basically, it's telling me to go update my, um, yeah, basically goes update my, uh, 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 what do they call it, um, node packages, CVE mentioned, yada, yada, yada. All right, so one of the things is I want to go back here to security, I want to go to code scanning alert, set up code scanning automatically detects vulnerabilities in your code. Code scanning uses action to run the analysis. Enabling this feature will create a uh, new workflow file, yada, yada, yada. And it says configure other scanning tools. So, no, it shouldn't be. I mean, I might, I've always used a free account for all these years. Here it is. Now here's the deal. Is this, I need to find the original press release. Yeah, this was November of, here it is, here it is, here it is. From October 2020. Announcing third party code scanning tool static analysis and developer trainings. Last week we launched code scanning for all open source and enterprise developers and we promised today to share the extensive ability, capabilities and the uh, GitHub security ecosystem, okay? Last week we launched code scanning, yada, yada, yada. Today we're happy to learn 10 new third-party tools available with GitHub code scanning. These open source projects and, uh, and static and application security testing solution bring yada, yada, yada. So hopefully that static analysis and code scanning will be part of your development arsenal, arsenal if you do like programming. But the one thing that is interested that is mentioned here is Veracode, which I'm gonna to show today. Veracode is a leading AppSec partner for creating secure software, reducing risk of security breaches and increasing security development team productivity. Veracode static analysis provide fast automated security feedback to developers in the IDE and the pipeline and conducts a full policy scan before deployment, yada, 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 okay? So, you can go back here and I could actually go and set up Veracode and option, yay! Get fast feedback on Veracode static analysis, yada, yada, yada. Let's see what happens if I hit the configure button. I don't wanna do it today. So here is your workflow. What do I set up, like usernames and all that stuff? Here it is. Oh, I have to, ah, here it is, here it is. I have to set up, like, you know, the Veracode API keys and all that other fun stuff. All right. So, all right, so now, yeah, Veracode can be integrated into GitHub. Yep, 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 yep. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So now I want to go back to SJS Smiley's question. Is there a student version of Veracode? So what is Veracode? Veracode.com. Veracode is based out of Burlington. 
Massachusetts. And it was founded by my friend, um, and also I would consider a mentor, uh, Chris Weishoffel, also known as Weld Pond. If you go to cs116.org, they the readings, and in the first week, I said, I said in the course introduction, one of the best, uh, an article I want people to read is A Disaster Foretold and Ignored in the Washington Post. Here it is, circa 1998. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven gentlemen. They all testified in front of Congress that um, they can shut down the internet. Seven young men sat, uh, sat in Capitol Hill, most powerful lawmakers. And basically, they, can, they told them that they can shut down the internet within seconds. Here's Weld Pond. He, is Dildog in here? No, Dildog is not in here. He's one of the founders, Wild Pond, of what is now Veracode. Okay. So, software security is their business. Where's the management team? Is he still here? Leadership, here it is. Yep. Chris is still the uh, Chief Technology Officer. There he is. Give a shout out to Chris. Thank you so much, Chris, for all your years of support for me and also for donating uh, the Veracode Platform Analysis Center for our students to use each and every year since fall of 2013. So to answer SAS's Smiley's question, it is student version of Veracode? The answer is no, but. The answer is no, but. We have. I was gifted a subscription of Veracode basically for a long time, so let's leave it at that, uh, for students to use. Oh, uh, yeah, enter in your username and password. Oh, I log logged out. Uno momento, por favor. Log in. And here it is. Now the air code looks like. So how do you actually create a static analysis scan of an app is you, well, first of all, you, if you're a tough student, you just email me for permission. You, all you need to do is email me, say that you want an account to Veracode, so you want to start scanning stuff, whatever it is. I'll give you an account to Veracode. Once you get an account, you can do what is called start a scan, static analysis, add new application, create your app, yada, 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 upload a zip file or your binary, doesn't matter, doesn't need to be a full source, yes, you can even upload a binary and what Veracode will do will decompile the entire binary into code and follow the instruction it could take anywhere between three minutes to three days sometimes even three weeks to get your results but I want to show you what a result can look like I want to show you now we use this in security class for years I want to show you a couple of examples here Aha, here we go. So I got a couple of really good examples. What you get back. So I'm going to show these two projects here. 
on a uh, Facebook follower uh, counter bot this was sent in 2017 and also an automated resume analysis tool from 2020 this was when I taught senior caption I'll show you what the results look like Facebook follower counter bot project let's take a look I'll click on this both of them are done static analysis was done so this project got a 74 out of 100 think of it as literally a 74 out of 100 like a C the activity log I want to give a shout out I think Connie Doyle did this I want to give a shout out to Tidy wherever you are you want to see the results let's go to the results there it is and the results open floor severities two very high no high 75 medium issues and no low issues at the top risk cryptographic issues code injection direct traversal cross-site scripting server configuration okay so let's view the report got our findings There it is, code injection. Code injection is the process of injecting untrusted input into an application that dynamically evaluates and executes input as code. Common examples of code include remote file inclusion or eval. Yeah, didn't we see eval injection? Didn't we do eval earlier today into an application and to an interpreted language such as PHP? Uh, associated flaws, which is by CWE, remember CWE ID, CWE 95, improper neutralization of directives and evaluated code. And what that VR code will do is, okay, the flaw ID, module, location, and exploitability, which is likely. Hi, cross uh, CLR, carriage return line feed, yada yada, here's the description of it. The associated CWE ID. Here is a file in which the uh, vulnerability was found. Yada, 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 line 118. Cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting attack occurs, yada, yada, yada. We've done cross-site scripting before. Cross-site scripting is CWE ID 80. And here are the modules and the line location in the file. The module and also the line number of where the vulnerability is. Yeah. A whole bunch of them. You get the idea. Now I'm going to go back. Can I go back? Hello? Here we go. Let me go to the Here it is. Here's another project. Automated resume analysis tool. This was a senior capstone project. 12.99. Go to results. Not bad. One medium issue: cross-site scripting. View the report. One cross-site scripting. Findings. Here it is: cross-site scripting. Yada yada yada. CWE ID 80. Backend server line app.py line number 34. Yeah. Yep. And of course, for your next lab, for your technical risk analysis lab, using VR code is, uh, is this is, I mean, I mark it as a 0.5 extra credit, like a half a point extra credit, but it should be the easiest half a point credit you'll ever get. Because the reason is, is I want people to start using static analysis tool, get into the habit of using static analysis tool. Hopefully a lot of students have been beaten to that now that when you write a C and C++ program, you use um, Valgren, which is for a dynamic analysis to check for like memory errors, memory issues and stuff. Now, you know, get into the habit of using static analysis tool to do any of your programming. Um, the old capture the flag game from last fall. I mean, this is a whole bunch of what we got from last. I think this was last year. I haven't been taught, taught at all. Yeah, 75 out of 100. It's not good. Results. 
So just to let you know, for the 0.5 extra credit for the lab and the static, and the, the static uh, technical risk analysis, you can scan anything that you want. Anything. I don't care. It doesn't need to be the CTF game. But everyone actually just choose the CTF game because it's just easy to do. But you're at your, you're, you can scan anything that you want to get the 0.5 extra credit. But the point is just start using static analysis for your programming and the coding. Yeah, and here it is. It's copyright SQL injection, cross-site script encoding, injection, credential management. Yeah, that sounds... That was a whole gist of the CTF game. Okay? Review the report. And also, doing... I'm, I'm going to say this verbally on the air here today. If you actually... You can actually legally cheat for this lab by actually doing the static analysis scan first then actually write your whole risk table based on based on your findings here. Yeah, this second to last lab in this course on a, writing or doing a technical risk analysis of the CTF game, you can legally cheat. It's pretty hella dumb. You can actually do this, uh, an, uh, the easiest way to do it, do a static analysis scan of the game using their code, get your .5 extra credit, and then write your own chart. And then, yeah. Yeah, it's so dumb. I mean, yeah, it, it's super. This lab is like, if you get, yeah, I mean, Uncle said it, yeah, it's highly recommended. But yeah, also now you can also incorporate GitHub. I mean, uh, you can incorporate VR code into GitHub. And that's it. That's static analysis tool. Get into the habit of using it. Um, if you actually want to know, and there's actually a really couple of really cool reads on static analysis. Um, one of them is this one, Lessons on from Building Static Analysis Tools at the Google. Well, we allowed to, yeah, basically that's, we're, we're, we're allowed to just, cop, well, kind of, kind of. That's pretty much what you can do, just follow the instruction of the table. And that's also like how static analysis is also done at GitHub as well, too. But yeah, get into the habit of using static analysis tools so you don't have to write shit code. That's it. And that's all I got for today, folks. That's it. That's today. A little longer than I wanted, but yeah, I hope I got the message across. Yeah, bad code. Don't write bad code. And use static analysis tool. Someone also asked me one year, like I think it was last year, that's a great question. Like, what's the, what's the correlation between bad programming and vulnerabilities. Well, as you saw today, a lot of bad programming lead to vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Yeah, and that's it. In an industry to put through fear, um, oh, shit, Boundless is a great, qu that, that, that one gets a plus one. Absolutely. Not through Verico, but there's so many other ones, like Coverity. Is also another, but that's by Synopsys now. Companies use their own tools. Some people like Ver, some companies like Verico, some companies love Coverity. Um, but yeah, the bottom line is: is it industry standard to put your code through static analysis before deploying? And the answer is absolutely, hands down, yes. So if you, any one of you use CDCI tool here, what CDCI is? Um, continuous integration and uh, continuous um, continuous integration tools. They all have static analysis tools like integrated now. So I got a presentation one year from um, TripAdvisor. Yeah, and so you can add static and code analysis to see A lot of companies like TripAdvisor, um, I don't know what they use, but they put their entire app through a pipeline and like, one piece of the pipeline is static code analysis. So answer the boundless is absolutely. But so many but places use different tools. Lush. Some companies pay, some cases. Google use their own. They make their own. Great question. Fantastic question. All right, folks. That's all I got for today. It's good to be back. And of course, oh, and this all leads to one last topic, big topic. You'll understand why static and static analysis was this week. You'll need it for next week. Take care, folks. Yeah, thanks, everyone.